Hello, welcome to today's episode of Rock Code Live. I'm your host, Rock Code. Today, we're going to be taking a, a bit of a look at the Rust programming language. We're going to be doing a few exercises and walking through everything you need to know to start writing Rust yourself. Today, I am joined by Steve Klebnik. He is a <laughs> co-author of the Rust programming language, an engineer at Oxide Computers, and a core team member of the Rust project itself. Hey, Steve, how are you? Hey, doing well. How about yourself? Uh, very well, thank you. It's almost at the end of my day. I believe it's more towards the start of your day. It's right at I, noon here. So yeah, right, noon, right smack in the middle. <laughs> awesome. So do you want to just give us the quick 30 second version about who you are and then we'll drive into today's session? Yeah, totally. So I've been uh, I've been using Rust for something like seven or eight years now, pretty well before Rust 1.0. And uh, I, I really love the language. So I ended up uh, being one of the first people to write a tutorial from it uh, and uh, kind of just like went from there. And now years later, it's like what I do all the time. So it's been really cool to watch a language go from like 30 people in an IRC room to literally being used by the largest technology companies in the world to get all sorts of stuff done. Um, and yeah, my focus has traditionally been on like documentation and teaching people and doing stuff like that. So as you said, I co-authored the, the book, which is the Rust programming language, which is kind of the, the default book for learning Rust. And I run the beginner Rust training at RustConf and do all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, totally. And nice. Oxide Computer Company is a place that I work uh, using Rust to do embedded stuff. We're building some servers. And uh, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm doing my my day job now. Nice. I like the t-shirts; they're pretty sweet. Yeah, thanks. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think why well, I'm so excited by this session is that Rust just seems to be everywhere now, right? Like, I mean, I kept an eye on it a few years ago, and you could see it growing in popularity. Um, I, I think everywhere I look now, there's either people that are writing Rust or people that just want to write Rust, and I think. It's just so available these days. I see a lot of really cool stuff with WebAssembly. I see a lot of people doing embedded systems, something that I think you're working on now. And then even as far as actor-based systems and web-based systems, Rust just seems to be sweeping. And it seems to be such a popular choice no matter what the domain is. Now, yeah. I, I don't know. Can you explain that? Like, totally. Why is Rust so popular? I think there's a couple of different things. So what initially drove me towards Rust was that uh, I, I really like programming languages and I like learning ones. And I've like switched between languages a lot uh, historically. Um, and uh, actually, I primarily was doing Ruby before I did Rust, to which I joke that uh, I only program in languages starting with RU now. Um, I told that joke in Russia. And I was like, I have to learn Russian, too, because it's also <laughs> RU. Um, but uh, no, there's a, there's a couple different reasons why that's happening. So so originally, um, Rust is kind of like really trying to focus on the sort of C and C++ use cases. And there hasn't been a lot of motion in that corner of the programming language space. Like, there's been a ton of new languages appearing that are like great for higher level things. But there hasn't really been anything that's been like a serious competitor in the low level space for a while. Um, and so that's why. Mozilla was interested in Rust and why they sort of sponsored the initial development um, in the early days is because uh, Firefox is millions of lines of C++ code. And you know you don't want to visit the wrong web page and have some JavaScript like own you. Um, so web browsers need to be super secure. But you're sort of using these very sharp and very dangerous tools. And so Mozilla folks said, like, what if we could have a, a language that's just as powerful as C and C++, but doesn't have as many of the significant drawbacks that they do? Um, and so that was kind of the original genesis from there. But as it turns out, um, some of the ways in which we we accomplished that task meant Rod was, Rust was like a little more broadly applicable. And so it's it's sort of been funny, like over time, exactly as you said, we've seen these other use cases kind of like open up as time goes on. And like, if you had asked me, would I write a web service in Rust? eight years ago, I would have said, absolutely not. That would be ridiculous. And now there's tons of people who are doing that even in production. And it's like actually a reasonable choice. So that's been kind of a surprise to me. Uh, it turns out also that there are other places, like you mentioned WebAssembly specifically. It turns out WebAssembly has a lot more in common with an embedded device than it does with a web page in many ways. And so languages that are really good for this like small constrained environment also operate really well in that small constrained environment. So there's been some interesting like kind of cross pollination because of those sort of things. And then finally, I think another thing that's sort of driven this kind of uh, renaissance in this area is as we've moved to the cloud uh, and we're built on things like uh, you know CPU time, 
um, languages that have more performance and use less memory turns into direct, you know, bottom line cost savings. Um, you know, back whenever we had our own servers and we didn't like care a super a ton about like scale, when you had one server and it was running your application, you were just paying for that server and that was it. Uh, you know, you could use whatever you wanted as long as it fit on that server. Now, when people are spinning up thousands of servers by just, you know, running a small command on AWS, if you can spin up 500 servers instead of 1,000 servers, you're going to save yourself a lot of money. And so there's been kind of a, a renewed interest in languages that prioritize efficiency um, because it directly saves you cash. Um, so that's also, I think, a, a reason why people are looking at Rust where maybe that wouldn't have made as much sense five or 10 years ago. Um, Definitely. Well, there's a lot of really good points there. I think that's the best answer I've ever had to an unplanned question. Like that Thanks. was quite, quite in depth. <laughs> it's in in some ways I'm planning for these answers for like ten years. It's well, not entirely unplanned, but you're definitely right. The like off the off the cuff. Um, yeah. I was going to say the last thing is we've tried deliberately to build a really friendly and welcoming community. We're not always perfect at that, but like you can get answers from Rust people, and we've developed a culture where like no beginner question is off limits. Like we are super happy to help people. And that's often uncommon in uh, especially the lower level uh, spaces online. And so we've also sort of developed a big following because people know and trust that they can get help with their problems without being like told that they suck. Um, and that's definitely super useful as well. Um, yeah, I think that's something I've noticed in general with not just the Rust community, but the, the Rust tooling. There seems to be a lot of effort on documentation and even the compiler error messages and tutorials online. There's just a lot, I guess, because the community is going so fast, there's a lot of new people and those are those people are getting a lot of help along the way, which helps everyone across the spectrum. Yeah, totally. Uh, there's, there's one guy specifically, Esteban Cooper, who works on error messages. And his kind of approach is that like, and we'll see, I guess, how that goes as we uh, <laughs> actually do this code. But his idea is that like the compiler is like a pair programmer and it should be helping you. So you shouldn't just get a message saying your code is wrong. It should try to help you actually figure out what you need to do in response to it. Sometimes it's very good at that. Sometimes it's not very good at that. But like a concrete example is, um, Rust has async await, kind of like JavaScript does, but we use a different syntax than JavaScript does. So we actually changed the Rust compiler knows how to parse the JavaScript understanding of async await, specifically to give you the error message saying, hey, I see you're trying it like this. Turns out we actually do it like that instead, so you should change your code. And so that's kind of an idea mm -hmm. about how this tooling can like help people is you know, by, by not just being like, that's an error, but actually being able to understand, hey, I think you're trying to do this because you come from a different language. And that's really super cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, async await is one of those things. Like, I've written a little bit of Rust to be dangerous, but every time I venture down the async path, I just seem to like shoot myself in the foot so many times. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's so much the Rust async syntax or the docs. It's that I keep trying to do it with Actix, which doesn't have great documentation anyway. So, it's, gotcha. Yeah, it's definitely should... a moving target in a complicated space for sure. So, yeah, but it's good fun. So let's get my screen share then. Yeah, so we we have. You know, we've not done anything in advance. We've not even had that much of a conversation. As far as I know, neither of us have looked at the Rustlings examples before, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Mm -hmm. uh, if people are curious and want to follow along or do this in their own time, it's just the Rustlings repository on the Rustlang uh, GitHub organization. Now, it seems to have, now I know the, the bit on the right is painful to read, and I guess I can zoom in just now and then zoom back out. But it's got four quizzes, and I figured we'd try and work our way towards quiz one. We'll see how we're doing for time, and maybe we'll try and get a few more bits and pieces in after that. Totally. What I would suggest to anyone watching, if there's anything you want us to try and answer questions on or cover or any sections we should take a look at, feel free to drop that in the comments, and we'll do our best uh, to tackle that. Now, quiz one. Uh, one more. There we go requires us to work with variables and functions, which makes sense. It's probably two of the most common things we want to cover. So let's grab variables first and see what we're dealing with. So Yeah. To, to briefly interject, the way that this Rust things kind of works is that you, you try to compile the examples and they fail. So this is a not working program. And so we'll like run it and it'll tell us, hey, this doesn't work and we have to fix it to make it work. Um, so that's kind of the general structure of this if you haven't heard of Rust things before. Um, Nice. Uh, so we run this wrestling's watch command. My terminal is acting a bit weird. You know, I'm just going to do that here. <laughs> totally. There we go. OK, so yeah, it's trying to compile variables one, and it's telling us the variable uh, cannot find value x in this scope. So let's just take a look at this. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, if we look at this code, we can, first of all, I mean, we should cover the basic syntax for anyone that's completely new to Rust. Totally. Fn, I'm assuming, is a function. <laughs> Correct. It's how you declare functions. Uh, there's actually a fun trivia here. So it used to be in the very old days that Rust had a rule that no keyword could be longer than five characters. And that's because they tended to prefer brevity. Um, over time, we relaxed that, but we sort of kept it where extremely commonly used key names or keywords are very short and lesser used ones are very long. So it turns out that FN was one that you use all the time. You define lots of functions and uh, you know we, we decided it's worth keeping short. So uh, that's why it's, it's, uh, it's so, so short. Um, we thought about fun or funk, but uh, in the <laughs> end we decided that FN was, uh, was good enough, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, this this looks like C style or C derivative style code. I guess that most people should find this relatively familiar to them, even if we just even if the keyword is slightly different. And I guess this is very similar to Go as well, which is also a C derivative. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you want to explain the exclamation mark here to people? Yeah. So uh, basically, this is print ln, which is like print line. Uh, again, with a small abbreviation there. But the uh, exclamation point is because this is a macro. So we're definitely not going to get into writing macros uh, in this because honestly, I'm not even that good at writing macros. <laughs> but um, the, the trick is, is that uh, macros let you write code inside of them that uh, is not normal Rust code. And so depending on the macro, of course. And so the exclamation point, or sometimes you say bang, um, means that this is invoking a macro. And so the stuff that's inside might be a little weird. Now, specifically, you might say this doesn't look weird, but it turns out that Rust actually functions can don't have a variable number of arguments. So this, uh, like, if we wanted to just do hello, this, um, this would not work in a regular Rust function because the second version here has one argument and this, the, the one on line 13 has two arguments. So we use a macro to, because uh, we want that extra flexibility um, because, as you might imagine, um, this is going to print the value of x by interpolating the value of x into where the little curly braces are. Um, and so uh, we need to be able to like know if you have if you have three sets of curlies, you want three other arguments as well as the string. And so the the println macro does a whole bunch of really fancy stuff to make all that work and work nicely. Um, yeah, basically the exclamation point is is used when you're when you're doing macro stuff. Very cool. Yeah, mac meta programming or macros is something that I always struggle with. Like I've written a fair amount of Elixir in my time, and every time I go to write a macro, I still fall over many, many times before I get it right. So totally. <laughs> Luckily, Rust has a like culture of uh, external packages and letting people use them. So I use macros other people have written all the time, constantly. But so many people have written so many useful ones that I don't really find it to be necessary to write my own very often. So that's kind of like a, a fun interplay of that is that there's definitely a lot of macros in Rust, but you almost never need to write them. You just need to be able to use them. OK. So let's break down this error message. And it's telling us that yeah. x is not in scope. Now, it kind of looks like this. This is, this is subtle, right? I must, yes. I, I'm not sure if I understand this, but I'm assuming that this just maybe wants a let here. Correct. So to introduce a new variable, you need to use the let keyword. And so that's what this example is trying to teach you. You can't just use the name itself. Um, you specifically say let, and then the name of the variable, and then an equals, and then the value of what goes into that variable. Um, so yeah. Okay. So by adding the let, if I pop over here, it compiles, and we passed variables one. Yep. And you can that's see it. x has the value <laughs> five, because it put the five in where the curly braces were. And that's the, the bit that it printed out. So yeah. OK, uh, can we tackle one more thing on this example then before we move on to variables yeah, two? Yeah, absolutely. We didn't define a type here when mm -hmm. we defined what x is. Uh, is this the compiler doing type inference and, and doing that for us? Or is yes. there something else happening here? It's, it's specifically the compiler infers the type of what it should be. Um, and so Rust can feel like a dynamically typed language often, but is super, super statically typed. Um, one interesting thing about this, and I was going to mention this too with the, uh, the function main syntax. So first of all, main is where Rust programs start executing. So you're always going to have a main function somewhere, and that's like where things begin. Um, but we require you to put types in for arguments to functions and return types. I'm sure we're about to get into that in a second. So the main function has no arguments and no return. So therefore, there's no types written there. But you may see types in function declarations. And I'm guessing, given that that's where we're going next, we're, we're about to segue into that. Um, 
but uh but yes all right let's see oh, let's just pop open variables too then and see i think happens. it says so this paragraph says about this i am done thing it's like you got to remove uh rem when you feel ready for the next exercise remove the i am done comment so i think that that's yeah totally. there we go awesome cool all right uh, so i'm done and then now we have variables too so our error message is all right okay so x doesn't have a type yeah so this one is like a, a little bit trickier um so uh when it comes to numbers specifically there's a lot of different kinds of numbers in rust so we have both signed and unsigned numbers which basically means like is there a negative sign so unsigned numbers can go from zero to some big number and signed numbers go from negative some number to positive some number um and so there's there's a lot of them i think there's like something like 16 different types or something like that forget eight there's let's I'll, I'll write them out real quick we got uh u8 u6 oh can't type u16 u32 uh u64 and u128 and then so those are the unsigned types those can only be positive and then there's i8 i16 i64 uh and i128 uh, there's also a couple other, um, these are only the integer types. So right there, you can see one, two, three, four, five. So we've got 10 types right there. Um, there's also floating point numbers and uh, some other related types. So what's happening here is um, in the earlier example, we didn't have to write a type because you weren't doing anything with that variable. And so Rust just picked the default, which is U32. Um, but here it's confused because we have this number 10 and we have this X and it's like, it's really, uh, it's really like not, it's not understanding what's going on. Now, the reason it's not able to understand, I'm gonna delete all these type names so this actually works. If you think about this, we never set a value to X in the first place. And so when trying to say like, they're, they're basically like Rust does not have the idea of null so in many languages, if you did something like this, you make a new variable and you don't give a value, its value would be null. But uh, here, we never gave it a value at all. And so Rust effectively has no idea what this type is. So it says, hey, I'm gonna compare this thing. I don't know what it is to 10. Is that valid? I have no idea because I don't even know what X is in the first place. Um, so that's kind of like what this is complaining about. Does that make sense? It does. So based on my naive knowledge then there's two ways that i think we can fix this and i'm going to see if you can correct me on this now i don't know but if i set this to be an unsigned and let's just say we do uh, an eight sure. does that have a default value that then that x will become it does not have a default value let's see what the compiler says whenever you you do this because i'm i'm interested in the exact error message actually uh yeah so use of possibly uninitialized variable X. And so it's saying, hey, you may have never given this a value. It can figure it out most of the time, but it says possibly because it's it's like, you might have do it, I just might be, <laughs> I just might not know. Um, there's some complicated details there, but the point is, is that it's like, hey, you haven't actually initialized this to a value, so I'm gonna give you an error. Um, now there is a way that you can opt in to giving a default value. Um, and so some types do have a default. So uh, I, I, let me show you that real fast. Well, actually, let's talk about the other way first because they're going to converge um, to, to one thing, I guess. OK, um, so I'm assuming, I mean, I can leave that type definition there, but I could also just set it to 0, and I could remove that, and that would right. that would be OK, right? Yes, it should be. Let's see what the compiler says. <laughs> it works. Okay. Yeah. So um, so yeah, so now it like looks at it and says, oh, I have a number and a number. Neither of them have types, so they're both U32, so everything is great. Um, and that totally works. And if you were to put back the U8 thing, it would go, oh, then I have a U8 and something I don't know what type it is. They must both be U8s, and that's fine. And it just like figures it out, basically. Um, the uh, there, So you can opt into the default value by doing this. Uh, this is maybe slightly more. I'm interested to see if this compiles or not. Actually, let's let's run this real fast and just check. It did. It did. So um, yeah. So some types have a default value, but you have to explicitly ask for them. So this is saying uh, there's a thing called a trait in Rust, which I don't think we're going to get to, but they're sort of like interfaces if you've used Go or Java. Um, similar kind of idea. And so you can say like, please give me the default value of the default interface for this type. And so Russ is able to say, oh, U8 has a default value, which in this case is zero. 
um, and will actually give you that sort of default. But it's an opt-in thing rather than an opt-out thing. And you'll see this happen a lot with Rust, which is one of the reasons I think it's a great question that you asked, is basically like, there's many things where in other languages, something is the default. And in Rust, it's like, oh, that's not there. But if you want it, you can make it happen. Um, and so in this case, uh, you, have to, you have to expressly say, please give me the default value if you want one. Um, I'm assuming that's just zero, right? I think I'm 99% sure it's zero, <laughs> but I don't use it very often. So who knows? We'll find out, though. Yeah, OK. Yeah, there totally. we go. Default is zero. That would make sense. I, I was going to be sad if it wasn't zero. <laughs> OK, let's remove our I am done. And we'll see what we get next. So variable three with an error. Uh, oh, no immutability. Nice, OK. Yeah. So let's see if I can articulate the problem here. So we define x as 3. We are printing it out and then trying to reassign it, and that is failing. Mm -hmm. so, uh, now, everything by default is immutable in Rust. Is that correct. a correct statement? Right, yes. Okay. Um, so this exercise is wanting us to introduce the mute keyword. Totally. <laughs> so that works. Um, one fun thing, if you remove the mute and go back to the error that you got previously. So when I was talking before about how the compiler tries to help you, you can see that there it's got this arrow pointing to X and it says, hey, make this mutable by changing it to mute X. And so Rust is actually able to say, like, this may be what you want. And there's actually a tool called Rust Fix that can take these suggestions and apply them to your code automatically if you trust the compiler that much. <laughs> Every once in a while, it gets it wrong. But most of the time, it's pretty good about understanding what's uh, what's going on. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, so that's also a thing. All right, let's stick our mute back in then. Uh, let that say yes. And then remove our I am done. Variables four. So this one is actually very similar to number two. So I'm sort of surprised that they're so similar. Um, but it's the same. It, it is right. It's just a no, no value, right? Yeah. It's like well, it, it doesn't have one because it's like yeah, there's no there's no null value. So uh, it's complaining about I don't know what that is. Right, let's just assume that passes. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And so that's the next one. Back. OK, so let's hold on. I'll read my error messages first. So expected string found integer. Yes. Uh, OK, so we define a variable called number. Uh, we print it out. And then it's trying to be reassigned and then manipulated in the next print. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot going on there, then. <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, so this is kind of showing you how uh, once you give a variable some sort of value, you can't change its type later. So if this were Ruby or Python or JavaScript, you know, it's totally fine to have something be a string and later change it to a number, and that's like not a big deal. But uh, in Rust, variables have like a type whenever you you know make them, and that type can't change, even if the value can change to something within that similar type. So uh, yeah. Okay, so the fix here is just yeah. It I I find it's interesting. I'm not sure what the fix is they want you to do here, um, but I can show you an interesting fix, uh, which is to do this. So, uh, oh, so this will actually work, and this may be what they're talking about, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, so what this is actually doing is this is introducing another variable with the same name. Uh, and uh, so this is not mutating the original number three that's a string. This is creating a new variable with the same name, which means the old one is no longer accessible. And so this actually does work. Um, and this is like a thing that's either really normal to you or really weird to you, depending on which programming languages you've used in the past, frankly. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with weird, but yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and okay. So that just means we, we we remove all references to the form or variable known as number. Well, like that's, that's, check that's check it out like this. Maybe this will help make it make sense. So uh, imagine we have a new scope here. So we have curly braces, right? So now this declares the new variable three, but then it's going to go out of scope on this line. 
So now here, the old one still exists. You can kind of think of it as like you have a deck of cards. So you have like the five of clubs and you put a new card on top and it's like the two of hearts. And then later you pull the two of hearts off and the five of clubs is still like underneath there. Uh, this would print like T-H-R-E-E -E and then five and then T-H-R-E-E -E again, because it's kind of like you have this like, you know, deck of variables and then I didn't save it. So it's like oh. <laughs> uh, print the new thing. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So so you can see how it kind of like goes in a scope and then goes out of scope and the original value is still there. It's just the name is like no longer accessible. Um, yeah. And it's kind of like not super, you know, uh, there's certain situations in which this is very useful and it kind of makes the rest of the world less complicated, um, but it can feel weird if you're not used to it for sure. Um, it's kind of a semi-controversial choice. Oh, no, let me remove the I am done. We'll keep rest things happy. Oh, yeah. Okay, and I'm going to pop open number six. So here, oh, it's trying to define a constant, which is telling us that we have to provide a type. Type, yes. And it's actually telling us, hey, you might want to make this a 32-bit yeah, integer. which is the default. Um, so yeah, so, so similar to how we define variables with let, we can define constants with const. The difference is, is that we don't infer the type of constants. We make you put the type out. Um, and there's a couple different reasons for this, but uh, basically a lot of it boils down to uh, it is local variables. You're usually using them in one place pretty soon. And so it's like easy to figure out what the type should be. But constants are used globally in a lot of places and they like often become sort of an external API. And so you're required to write the type down on constants, um, even if you're not on on uh, regular variables. and constants, they're not just constant, but they're also kind of like global. So you can see how it's defined outside of the function. We could use this number in any of our functions anywhere, um, as opposed to just in the body of the function itself. All right. And it's always good to understand why these decisions are made. It makes things a lot a lot easier to understand. Totally. I, I've i often found that when I get mad about something in programming, if I learn about why the decision was made to make it that way, I'm like, you know, I can see why that choice was made. And so even though it's annoying <laughs> to me, like I get it and I get less mad about it. So, yeah. Well, you're doing a lot of embedded systems work now, right? So you're working directly with Linux syscalls? But not even right. with Linux syscalls, like we are writing an operating system. Like I'm the one oh. <laughs> building the syscalls. So yes. Uh, so I have to deal with the hardware and the decisions the hardware people made and like, why does this require, you know, doing this this way and that kind of thing. So it's the same thing, just one level down, uh, like mm -hmm. anything. I hope you kept the E in your create syscall though. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Okay. So this now we're onto the functions elements it's like okay we're going to understand yeah. how rust functions work we can see we've got our main function which we're now familiar with and it's trying to call a function that hasn't been defined yet mm -hmm. so i'm assuming we can just define our new function is, is that enough for that to yeah, pass it should be enough let's let's give it a run <laughs> done <laughs> so if we can, when we don't provide a return type or even any code within a function what happens there? Is that just a void type? Or? So sort of, kind of. Let's see what happens with functions two and three, and it'll be a little easier. I don't want to like get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, and I'm assuming that one of these next examples will sort of get into the details. Yeah. So this will be a little a little uh, more helpful. So the the error message, let's, let's take a look at the actual error message. So uh, there's a couple things going on. Um, as it says, Anonymous parameters. Oh, interesting. <laughs> That's a funny, not super ideal error message. Um, <laughs> but uh, basically, um, what it's saying here is that num is a, a parameter, but you haven't given it a type. So uh, it's expecting you to say what the type of num is. So I mentioned this before, variables get type inference, but the arguments to functions don't. And part of the reason for that is that uh, there's a couple different things, but the primary one is that sort of like Rust thinks about the function signature as being like the contract. And so you declare the contract up front, and then it checks that the body fits. So I kind of like to think about it as like the first unit test. You say like, I expect there to be this type. And so if it inferred the type, you could make a change in the body and that would change the type of the function. And then you get like weird bad error messages. And so Rust's attitude with this is put the types in the function signatures, and then you will get nice errors only in the body of your functions. Instead of, if you can imagine, like if we go back to the code, if uh, if we change the type of the body here 
and then this there was like a problem like up here on line seven, you would get an error message about line seven being wrong when your actual error message would be like, you know, your, your problem would be down here or whatever. Um, so if so, I said that's uh, the string, we'll see some sort of message that just says. Yeah, let's, let's see what happens. It's complaining. Maybe yeah, so. so it expected a string and found an integer um, because we're passing an integer in. And we tell it to expect an integer. It's happy. Yep. So this is how you pass arguments. And uh, it's sort of the same as the uh, variable syntax, except for there's no let, right? So you have the name, the colon, and the type, just like we had in variables. So it ends up being the same thing. OK, so I'm curious. Like, when it was like this and we were getting the error message, yeah. it told us that we could also, if not using the colon, use at or the pipe. Like, yes. what, would th what would those be? So it turns out that the syntax is not actually like a name colon type. The syntax is actually pattern colon type. And so this gets into some more interesting, complicated things. But like, uh, for example, Rust has tuples. So you could say, like, this won't work because I'm outside of function body, but to give you an example of like the syntax, so that x equals 1, 2. Oh, I hit escape, which is bad. Um, <laughs> so here, now x would be a tuple, where you have a first element 1 and a second element 2, right? Um, but because this is a pattern, you can actually do fancier things. So I could actually say, let x comma y equals one comma two, and this would assign one to x and two to y. So uh, so that's like a thing that's there. So there's actually a whole bunch of fancy things that you can do in here. And so uh, what actually this lets you do is there's, there's some more complicated syntax where you can put an at and then some more stuff here, or an or and then more stuff here. And so the error message is like saying like, you either need the, the type or you need to be doing one of those fancier things. So you almost never want to be doing those things. So that's why the error is like slightly misleading. Um, but it is technically the case that you could do that if you wanted. Um, All right. Good to know. So, oh, why is it's the next example? You removed. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That's silly me. All right. Okay. All functions. Good. Functions three. Uh, we have an error message that tells us expected one argument. This should be nice and trivial. I'm assuming it just yeah. wants us. To fix that. There we go. Okay. Move on functions four. Okay, we've got a little bit more code here. So we've got a main function setting some integer and then trying to calculate a sale price. So now you can actually see... see the right by your cursor, there's a little squiggly, a little red squiggly right after that arrow. And so I think that it actually it, uh, it gives you the error right in line. So Visual Studio Code has really great integration. Uh, if you install the, the Rust Analyzer plugin like you have, you don't even have to run them necessarily. It will figure out, hey, this is, I expected a type here. So that just, I wanted to point that out too before you uh, you know went back over. We could see what the full error is by looking at the terminal or whatever, but you can also get those errors in your thing. Pretty much the same error yeah, message. Basically <laughs> the same thing. So yeah, so the way that you do return types, you have a little arrow. And then that gives you the type of whatever you're returning. So in this case, we want to take in a price and then return the discounted price. So we need to take in an I32, but also return an I32. OK, that's it, right? Yeah, there Should we be. Go. And finally, we have functions five. So this is another fun one. Uh, So it's saying that it expected an end. Oh, OK, is this because we don't have a return keyword? Yes. So there's two ways to solve this. There's the like idiomatic and the unidiomatic way. It turns out that many languages do the what is unidiomatic in Rust. But you're totally right. Because we don't have a return keyword, this is going to multiply two numbers and then not give you the, the value back. So it's like kind of like a no op. Like it doesn't do anything. Um, so if you add return right before the num asterisk num, this should work and everything is great. So this works. However, Rust is what's called an expression-oriented language, which means that almost everything evaluates to some other value. So you can actually drop the semicolon and the return. And now we have just num times num on its own. The, the semicolon basically says like, hey, I don't care about the return value of this. I want to just like ignore it. 
So, uh, and that's why it's at the end of almost every line is because like, that's kind of like how the structure of the grammar works. So if you do it like this with just num times none with no return, that will evaluate to nine as well and give you the return value back. And this is very common in some languages like Ruby, for example, and totally foreign if you do C or JavaScript or whatever. So this is another example of where Rust has taken an influence from a certain style of programming language that can maybe feel a little bit awkward if you haven't worked in it. Um, and this is probably the number one thing that people who are new to Rust kind of complain about. So, um, and part of the reason why is that uh, when you start getting into things like closures, uh, this syntax becomes much more normal and regular and smaller. And so it ends up being uh, a lot easier. Um, but uh, that's kind of jumping ahead, I guess, a little bit. <laughs> so is the, the golden rule there that if you omit a semicolon, it's always an expression? Which means... it's, it's like kind of always an expression. You can kind of think of it as like expression uh, exists. And if you put a semicolon on it, then you don't get the value. You get an empty tuple, which is these double parentheses because like nothing in, inside. It's like we had the one and two before, uh, just an empty tuple. So uh, yeah, it's kind of a little weird, kind of a little in the weeds and a little technical. Honestly, the compiler will tell you when you get it wrong and you just fix it one of the other ways. And eventually you kind of develop an intuition and you stop worrying about it. Um, but uh, yeah. All right. So I think we have now covered everything for quiz one. I think now, so. We could do quiz one, which yeah. I guess would just confirm that we've learned stuff. Well, it's basically stuff. just writing the <laughs> syntax that we've learned in the previous uh, examples. Yeah. Okay, so it's telling me I'm not allowed to modify it. Okay, I have to write the calculate apple price function. Yep. All right. Take some. Price. Have the return value, mm -hmm. and I should probably read what it's supposed to do. Oh, it's how many apples I'm buying. So it's if you have more than forty, you, it only costs one. Basically, it costs two unless you're doing more than forty, in which it costs one. So there's like a very small calculation there. <laughs> All right. Well, number of apples. And snake case is the idiomatic Rust approach, is that right? In, so it's snake case for variables and function names, and it's camel case for types. So you'll see like capital S string or capital V vec. Um, and that way you can kind of tell at a glance if it's something is a function or variable or a type. Um, We return the number of apples times one or the number of apples. So you're close. <laughs> so, because of the way that you've written this, the if statement would turn into that number of apples, but it's not going to like return it from the function entirely. So you have two you have two ways of doing this. You can either make the whole body one if expression. You have two expressions here, right? You have the if, and then you have the second thing. So you can either do an if else, that way the whole body is one if statement, or you can use return to return early. And uh, uh, yeah, that, that actually will technically work. I think most people would write it inside the body of the if instead. So like on line 27, yeah. So this should work, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah you did it. And the alternative approach you said there was, uh, to do else here so that I only have one expression. And my yeah, function. and then now both arms of the if evaluate to a value and then the whole thing gets returned and so that ends up being the same thing. Yeah, so this is now right. one expression in the body instead of two expressions. Nice. All right, let's see. What does quiz two want from us? So this is the Let's string. talk about strings, yeah. This is definitely one of the things that always trips me up when I'm attempting to write rust i should totally say, is that should i mean what is the idiomatic way should i be using string or should i be using string types like yeah. is there a one i should use by default are there any rules and that maybe we could just start by saying what are the differences between totally these so for the background rust has sort of 
depending on how you answer this question, Rust either has one or like seven string types. Um, and part of that is because in many languages with like garbage collection and stuff like that, uh, strings are a little easier. But it turns out that any sort of variable width structure is really difficult whenever you're uh, whenever you don't have a GC and some other things. And so uh, this is kind of like strings are sort of the entry point into going from the absolute beginning. So we've sort of done stuff that looks the same in Rust as in basically any language. Strings are kind of like the, the usual point where people start learning a little more about the details of things. And honestly, it's so common that we actually reoriented the table of contents of the book around the question of what do you need to get to to understand strings and then how to explain strings as early as possible. So the first three chapters of the book are kind of all the generic sort of syntax that we've talked about so far. And then chapter four is like, let's get into it with strings. Um, so the way you can think about these, these are the two most core types uh, about strings in Rust. Um, the first one, the ampersand stir, um, if you've done some C or C++ or languages like that, you may recognize the ampersand means it's like a reference. Um, and the capital S string is sort of a uh, what we call an own string type. And so sort of the difference is, is that the ampersand stir is kind of like a, you're looking at some other string that exists somewhere. So it's immutable. You can't change anything about it. The capital S string means that you are the one who's in control of the data of the string. And so that means you can change it, you can modify it, you can grow um, and, and modify things. And so uh, that's, that's kind of like when you would use each one depends on what you know what you're trying to do if you want to change the string itself and modify it some way you'd be using capital s string um, if you just want to read the value and you don't care about doing modifications you would usually use ampersand string and one interesting thing that that kind of like comes out of that is it means that you often see ampersand string as arguments to a function and you often see capital s string as a return type of a function so if you think about it usually you take an argument you don't change it you just look at it and do whatever but if you're returning something that often means that you want to like the person who's getting that back is going to change it or modify it in some way or do something like that. Um, so you can see this exactly line 12 here. We're returning a capital S string, but uh, it turns out the string literals are ampersand string. And so it's going to complain that the types don't make sense if you uh, if you run the, the uh, compiler. It should. Uh... Oh, I didn't remove my. Oh, yeah. I think it didn't get saved on variable 3.rs. Oh, yeah. Line 4 is. Yeah. I'm not done. I know. It's. Uh, a nice coincidence that I had to open this again, I guess, actually, mm -hmm. because we had a question from someone oh, cool. for it. quiz one. And I think, because this is slightly out of context, I'm going to try and guess what they asked. Uh -huh. But does it work with the parenthesis? And I'm assuming what they're suggesting was this approach, but removing these. So those, that might be a question. I don't think that's what they asked, but no. this does not work, it's true. Um, those are curly braces, not parentheses. The parentheses are the around number of apples greater than or equal to 40, the, the rounded okay. ones on line 26. So um, yes, and actually the compiler will warn you if you put those parentheses in there because they are actually not needed in Rust. Um, and so you can put them if you want, but uh, usually people drop them off. So uh, yes, that's a... Both both versions of if whichever way they meant, those are the two answers to those two questions. Totally. Oh, you're right. I don't know why I thought those were prints, but we're good. That cool. was good to know anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm so used to this in Go that I now accidentally type or try to do that in other languages, and then always end up getting frustrated. So it's good that that works there. Yeah. There's actually a really interesting history there about programming languages and grammar and stuff, but we're getting too far off topic probably, <laughs> so I won't get into it. But just the point is, new languages have dropped it because they require the curly braces. If you don't require the curly braces, then you need the parentheses more than if you don't, and so that's there's there's a whole bunch going on there. It's actually a pretty interesting question if you're into languages. Um, so yeah. Uh, okay. So this why is that one on this to is, primitive types? Why, why did it go to primitive types? Yeah. Maybe that's because that's the next one instead of this one. Well, quiz maybe. two said strings though. Oh, that's uh, I guess okay. Maybe this is not a quiz on primitive types, so that's okay. Maybe that's um, what it is. Yeah, it's a quiz. We'll we'll just walk through strings one and two, and then we can double back. So sure. it looks like we have two options here. Then is that, and, and someone had suggested this in the comment. So mm -hmm. SD has says we could just can we change the return type to just be an ampersand string instead of an uppercase string? Yes. So uh, the answer is yes, but there's also a small caveat. So if you try to compile this, it will actually complain. Uh, Uh, maybe it's not what to run, right? Uh, maybe, yeah. There you go. Right, so it says expected named lifetime parameter. And so 
this helps as if the return type is borrowed, but there's no value for it to borrow from, you wanna use the tick static lifetime. So this is very jargon heavy, but the point is basically uh, you can return the type, but if uh, if we go back to the code, I can sort of like show you. So since we're like referencing a string that lives somewhere else, normally what would happen is if you have some sort of like, say that this took, uh, this took an, uh, a string as an argument too, then it would say, oh, you want to return something that's borrowing from the argument. And so this would like be more normal, but we're not, we have no argument here. And so Rust needs to know, hey, you're referring to a string, but I don't know where you're referring to or what, what is going on. And so there's a special syntax called lifetimes that, uh, and there's a special lifetime called static. So the full name of string literals is actually this, which is ampersand tick static stir. And what that means is that tick static means that this lives forever, basically. And so since you have a literal string, it's never going to like be deallocated from memory or whatever. Um, sort of, there's a lot of complicatedness we could get into in theory in there, but just the point is that Rust will complain slightly and make you put this. So this is a valid solution to this problem. Um, I don't think so it's the one that they wanted to give you because it's a lot of syntax for a very little reason, honestly, um, <laughs> but it does work in this case. Um, so just to confirm, this applying a static lifetime to the string means that for however long our program runs, the string blue will always be stored in memory. Right. And okay. that's because it literally puts the words blue into the binary of your program. And so it's valid forever because it's like actually part of the like literal text of the thing that is on your computer that's running. Um, and if we want you to use the uppercase string, then yeah. I'm assuming it wants us to do initialize yep. like this. Oh, well, there. And that should also work just fine. It turns out that strings implement a lot of different interfaces. So there's actually like six different ways to write the body of this function that will all work. <laughs> this is the way that I personally prefer to write it. Um, and so this is what I would write if I was writing this code. Um, okay, good to know. Uh, and I think there was something important you were saying, you know, when you were explaining it to different types of thing is that if you're returning a string from a function, you probably always want to use an upper string uppercase string that allows it to be modified. Hard-coded strings, you can generally get away with using an ampersand string. Yeah. Is that roughly In what toy examples like this, you often have hard-coded strings. But like, imagine this is not current favorite color, but this is like load color from config file. The value in the config file would not be a literal string. It would be something we'd be reading from the file and returning. And so we would want to return the like capital S string where it's like, you know, you may look at it or inspect it or do whatever later. Um, and so that's usually you'll want the capital S string when you're returning things. Nice. Okay. Strings two, let's see what we've got here. So we're not allowed to change, or at least we're not supposed to be changing a definition of a word. Mm -hmm. We are doing an if is color word. Okay, so this is got the wrong type here. Right. And, and it's just returning a Boolean based on this expression. Yeah. Okay. I mean, is that just that? <laughs> you could you could do this, yes. I don't think this is what you want they want you to do, but you can definitely do it. So try run it and see if this works. I am like ninety nine percent sure that this will be fine. Yeah. yeah, totally. So that's cool. So you can totally do this. Um, however, I think what they want to do, there's kind of this joke in, in Rust, which is like you put an ampersand on it is the default uh, if the compiler yells at you. So you can convert. So that in the same way when I said the ampersand string is like a view into a string that lives somewhere else. So what you can do is there on line nine where you're at, if you make an ampersand word. So it's similar to how you have the ampersand stir. Uh, this will kind of this will make an ampersand stir that refers to the capital S string, and so this will also work. And so this is the code that I expect they would want you to write, and what is more uh, likely. So this this encapsulates a really common pattern in Rust, which is where you have this capital S string because you've loaded it from somewhere, but you want to operate on it in a way that's uh, you know like you're just reading the value. And so this is what I was saying earlier about how parameters are often ampersand stir. So all you need to do to convert the capital S stir string into a temporary ampersand stir is you just throw an ampersand on the front of it and then that will uh, coerce it appropriately. Um, okay, and the reason we wanted that approach instead of this approach is I guess because of well, the move semantics as well? Yes, totally. So if so you try to print to... word down here, this will, um, yeah, this would fail to compile because uh, 
as it says, you've you've moved it into the function. So when you when you pass a capital S string, you're saying like, hey, is a color word? This is your string now. Feel free to do what you want with it. And uh, at the end of the function body, it will deallocate that string, and so it will just like totally throw away all its contents. Um, whereas if you use the ampersand version, you're just passing in a temporary view into that string instead, and so uh, you know everything will be peachy keen afterwards. Yes, I guess I mean one of the nasty habits I seem to have got when I write some Rust now is to throw in dot clones. <laughs> yeah, this would um, also technically work. Um, what this would just do is copy the memory, and so this will basically just be very, very. I mean, it's five letters, right? So it's going to be extremely slower <laughs> and use a tiny bit more memory, like an imperceptible amount. So it's definitely not a big deal. And if you get your code to work with the clones totally super fine, especially when you're starting out. The important part is to get your program working. It does not matter if it's the fastest possible thing. Like One kind of interesting pattern is that a lot of people who are new to Rust make things harder on themselves than they have to be. Because once you're given the power of like making it so fast and small and tiny, you will, like want to make it the case that it is that fast and small and tiny. And so people will go to great lengths to avoid typing out a clone when like they could just have their program working and like this will still be faster than your Ruby or Python and still use less memory even though you're making an extra copy. So like don't sweat it when you're starting. Just like throw clone around. It's like it's totally fine. Not a big deal. All right. Well we'll leave that like that for now. Yeah. We'll, I don't know if we'll make it to move semantics, but we'll definitely have a look anyway. Uh, totally. so we've got two comments on this example. So SD is back and saying when we use string from uh, is this resource from the heap? Yeah, so what happens is is the string will will allocate some memory on the heap and then it will copy the green into the heap afterwards. So yeah, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily take it from the heap, it puts it on the heap, but I think that that's what you yeah. were trying to ask. Yes. Um, uh, and Zev is asking and this good cuz I actually had to stop too. Is there some magic between the ampersand on the string that casts that to uh, Yeah, yeah. String? This is a great question because I, I was I was trying to see if no one would notice. So you've got some <laughs> sharp viewers. Um, so technically, yeah, what you, what you may notice, if you think about it in terms of like, uh, I forget if that yeah, it does scroll down. So uh, if you think about this like, um, you know, okay, I have a string and then I'm gonna close the little terminal I have because I can't see this well. And then I put an ampersand on the front, that makes it a capital ampersand string. So how do we get a stir out of this? And the answer is, is that in Rust, there's an interface called DREF. And what that means is DREF. And so there's a special way that you can implement uh, DREF to do coercions. Rust, generally speaking, does very few coercions implicitly on its own. And this is one of the only cases in which it will enable a coercion. And so basically what ends up happening here is that uh, the, the implementation uh, there's gonna be a lot of syntax here, so I'm just gonna like show you, and then we'll uh, we'll like not worry about it because like there's gonna be a bunch. But in the standard library somewhere, there's some code that looks like this. Uh, I'm gonna change. I copied and pasted some some lines. So uh, I think it looks like this. I totally forget. Anyway, this is a whole bunch giant pile of garbage. The point is, is that it says like, if you have a string, you implement DREF for it, and the type that comes out is this stir. The reason there's no ampersand there is complicated and far too advanced right now. It doesn't matter. But the point is, is that like, there's this there's this implementation. You can go look it up if you really want to know how it works. Um, but whenever you have string DREFs to the target of ampersand stir, that means an ampersand string can turn into an ampersand stir. And so uh, this is just one of those magic coercions, and that that uh, it's like it's like one of those things where, and this is why I throw an ampersand on it is like often the solution to things in Rust because like many things will have this this pattern of like there's the type that is owned and mutable, there's the type that's viewable and like not changeable, and you implement DREF between them so you get this nice coercion. Um, so that's the that's the high level version of that answer, and you could you could fill up a whole podcast with just the details <laughs> on on specifically how all that works and like a bunch of things. Um, but yeah, that's basically basically what it is. Is Rust will coerce it, and there's an interface you can use on your own types if you want to implement that coercion. 
Oh, that's pretty cool. It's, it's nice that it's just using you know the different tree implementations, and it's not just some hardcore compiler magic that knows kind of what to do there. Like, yeah, there's a lot of things like this in Rust where the thing that is like would normally be compiler magic is hooked into via some sort of trait, and so you can implement that trait on your type and have access to the exact same same magic. Yeah, it's it's very common cool. in a lot of places. All right, let's move on then from there. So. It, was going to move us on to primitive types. Let's pop that open. So now we're looking at oh billions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is very similar to the stuff we've done before. Sometimes wrestling goes very slow because it's designed for being a single person with no help on their own. So it does a very good job of taking very small steps. But uh, you know, uh so we've we've kind of already covered this, which would be great practice if you know I wasn't here, but I, I think we've talked about this a bunch. So this should be pretty easy for you. Well, why don't we just pick something a little bit more interesting? Yeah, well, sure. We, we, we've got about, uh, say, 20 minutes left, based cool. roughly. So let's see. What have we got? Let's close it down. Follow exercises. Is there anything that you think yeah. would be fun to go through? I think maybe one good example next, so we have 20 minutes, is like in the intermediate part is sort of like structs. Because I want to show you how you can define your own types in Rust, because that's also a useful sort of thing. Um, <laughs> this is Rust Analyzer is on my side. It's got a lot of, yeah, my, my screen looks very different than yours. It's kind of funny, actually. Uh, almost all of the little like uh, uh, things where it says zero implementations on yours say like missing command on mine. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, I'll have to file a bug about the live code share, et cetera. Yeah, um, where's my Rust Analyzer with all its squiggles? Yeah, yeah, you've got it's good. <laughs> so, um, well, part of it's because, uh, yeah, anyway. Okay, so uh, let's let's just get into it rather than talking about bugs in the in the IDE integration. So um, on line six here, we have a struct, and so Rust doesn't have classes; doesn't really do object-oriented programming exactly, but it can feel like it's sort of. You've seen methods already and stuff like that. So the difference is that Rust has structs. So like, okay, uh, classes in, in object-oriented programming have sort of two things, right? You have the data and the behavior, and they go together in a class. And so Rust kind of says those are two separate things, so we should separate them. So instead of instead of classes, we have structs, which are purely data, and then we have functions and methods that are the behavior that operates on the data. So there's a little more separation um, in Rust than there is in other languages. So here we have this struct color classic struct, and uh, there's no data inside of the body of it, so it's not like super useful because there's there's nothing there. So if we look at down at the uh, examples um and like what these tests are kind of doing uh we can sort of see what they want us to do so um let's see so it's going to complain about uh green doesn't exist uh and then the name being this uh class extract thing so look up here yeah color class extract interesting so I don't know why it's referring to these as classic C structs. Maybe we'll figure it out as we type stuff here. But uh, down here on line 22, uh, where it says let green equals. So the thing it's saying is like, uh, we have this color classic struct, right, um, from above. And so this would be how we would like instantiate it, as we say the name and then the curly braces. Um, but it's going to complain because we don't have a name and we don't have a hex. So you can see on line 26 and 27, use green.name and green.hex to get sort of these like values. Um, so uh, what we'd want to do here is we would want to say name is uh, green and hex is bound zero zero ff00 um, and so this like this would work from declaring the body of it but it's going to give us an error about defining the struct up above um, so let's uh, let's briefly jump up there and we'll also check those out so color classic struct up here we would have uh, name is a uh, static stir and hex is also a static stir so I think that this text will now test will now work. Um, let's double check that's true before we talk about what the syntax looks like. Um, so this is complaining about thirty eight. So this is the yeah. other test. Yeah, so, so I think, I think, that's think okay. we're good. Um, cool. So yeah. So with a struct, if we look up here at line uh, eight and nine, 
very just much like we had the name colon type with variables and with function arguments is the exact same thing in struct. So here, this color classic struct ends up being uh, as two sort of data types inside of it. So one string with the name and one string with the uh, hexadecimal value of what the color is. Um, I'm guessing this is kind of like CSS colors or RGB values in general, where it's got some sort of name associated in the actual type. And so that's how you declare it. It's like uh, struct, name of the struct, curlies, and then the same name and value pairs. One thing you'll notice uh, is that there's a trailing comma here on line nine. So Rust has support for trailing commas. And uh, so that's really, really nice. Every time I go back to JavaScript or JSON and I can't put a trailing comma, I get a little sad. Um, but uh, you know, this is like a stylistic preference. You don't have to put one there. Um, if you leave it off, uh, that, that will work. But uh, it's usually people put them in because that's the preferred style of things. Um, so in the same way, that's how you declare a struct. We inst when we instantiate one, uh, you can see on line 24 to 27, it's almost the exact same thing as when we like assign a variable to a value, uh, except we're, uh, you know, we're let green equals and then the struct, and then inside of it, we have the name is green and the hex is that value. Um, and so the, the syntax mirrors the kind of declaration syntax in the same way. Okay, did you use a, a static lifetime string because of these assertions or would that just be like, common practice uh, not use this I use whatever. it because of the assertions usually in the same way that like if you return a value you will often return a capital S string most of the time in a in a real world struct like imagine again like I always go to the config file example because I think it's very intuitive so uh, if we were going to be loading this color from a file we wouldn't have a string literal and so I would use a capital S string um, and so I, I purely just did that because there are string literals in this text but normally um, I would I would sort of default personally to uh, to making this a string and making this a string and that will like work it just means that uh, this is going to get a little weirder we would want to do a string from down here and then same thing here and then finally I think this might this might compare or it might not we may have to toss the ampersand on it to get it to work um, but like this would be what the string from version would look like. And this looks a little grosser in the tests, but is more likely to reflect, reflect what like actual real world code would look like. Is there a macro for creating a string that simplifies the syntax? The thing is, is that like someone did release a crate, like a crates or packages in Rust. So somebody did release something that would let you type uh, S bang, but like, is it really worth getting a whole <laughs> external package just to eliminate like five or six characters here? Like generally not. Um, it's just like, it's like, it's, it's one of those things that it's like, it is slightly unfortunate that's a little long, but it's also not long enough to be so much of a pain that you like resort to something like a macro to fix it. Uh, there may be someday, maybe string literals will just coerce into capital S string automatically. There's definitely some people that want that. There's some people also that because of that heap allocation, there would be upset that we'd be doing heap allocation implicitly. And so um, there's kind of a, a battle over whether it's a good idea or not. Okay, uh, let's remove that. So there was a, a question that I was gonna keep to later, but because you're kind of talking about battles between what people want to see maybe it kind of nicely segues in uh, but we had a question that said uh, rust is very readable and enjoyable well, what does the team take into mind when it's trying to add new features and it's referencing things like c plus plus 20. yeah so i think the interesting thing about the wording of this specifically is like to make it complicated and ugly or are they trying oh, to say to not yeah, yeah. make it complicated yeah okay <laughs> cool there we go yeah awesome so one kind of like interesting thing about Rust and its syntax is a lot of people hate it and a lot of people don't understand why other people hate it. And the reason is, is that Rust really draws inspiration from a lot of other languages. So almost nothing in Rust is actually new. Many of the things, the, the name specifically is like evoking the idea of a well-worn tool, like something that's been around for a long time. Um, and so uh, like the, a lot of the syntaxes are drawn from like several disparate sources. So like you have some stuff that's a little C inspired, some stuff that's a little like ML or OCaml inspired, some stuff that's a little Ruby inspired, some stuff that's a little Python inspired. And that means if you like, if you don't have the uh, 
particular background, it can feel really, really strange. But if you do, it feels really, really normal. And that leads to a lot of areas in which like people will kind of be like, you know, why is it written like this? Because like no language is it like this. And they're like, well, if you've programmed an OCaml before, actually this is the exact same syntax. And so, uh, you know, or whatever. And so there's, there's definitely sort of kind of like fruitful uh, arguments to be had. I think the thing is, is that um, specifically referring C++, one of the things that's a challenge for C++ is that it originally was very much like an object-oriented language that was like very much designed in the late 90s when it was first released. And then over the last like 15 years, they've tried to morph it into sort of like a fun more functional-ish language. And so when you, it's kind of like trying to change the engine on a car while you're driving down the highway. Like you can do it, but it's like very complicated and there's a lot of constraints on the problem. And like, you know, you've got all these things going on. And so I would say the number one thing that we have in Rust to make it feel more simple is purely that we started so much later and we haven't gone through that process of like, let's mutate it into something else entirely means that there's a lot less weird corner cases because we, we haven't like done that make of a drastic change. And so I think the number one thing that we can do to make sure that Rust does not mutate into something like that is basically to say that like, we're never gonna like, go ahead and make a new language that replaces Rust someday, rather than trying to turn Rust into a totally different language incrementally over time. Um, and so that's kind of, uh, I think that's sort of like the key to it um, is like making sure that the bits stay orthogonal and that we're not trying to like change the core nature of what Rust is over time. Um, there are good reasons why the C++ folks are doing what they're doing and, and kind of like that's one of the reasons why it's still maintained its position of dominance for so long. So I don't want to say that that approach is wrong either, but I think that uh, we're kind of more like in the interest of like, we're going to keep the core of Rust the same way it is. And like maybe another better language will come along someday. And that's just kind of the natural way of the world. Um, so it'll, it's fine if we let that happen. <laughs> nice. Cool. Uh, okay. So shall we, I think the other example in this file is to take a look at a tuple based struct. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to do that? Or will we yeah. look at yeah, okay. We can do that cool. real fast because it's not too long. So in the same way that uh, I talked briefly about tuples before with like let x equals one, two. So this is like an anonymous tuple, like there's no name. You can also declare like a struct that looks like a tuple. So what you would put here is string, string. And so you can kind of see how it looks sort of similar, but it's just the type, no name and then the type. And so uh, that means that down here, uh, you would say let green equals uh, color tuple struct, and then that would be string from green and string from found OO, FF OO. Uh, and so this kind of looks more similar to a tuple, but uh, the name, uh, it's got a name to it instead of it being anonymous. And so the way that you access, we don't have names, you access them by numbers. So dot zero and dot one would give you green and zero F uh, zero zero because we haven't done a name. And so like under the hood, this operates the exact same way. Uh, just like sometimes one or the other feels more natural in a given situation. And so, uh, you know, if you have something that's very simple and small, like if you have a point uh, you know, maybe you don't want to go the whole X, Y, Z, maybe just like zero, one, two is like good enough or whatever. So tuples tend to be good in very simple circumstances and giving things names tend to be useful when you have something that's a little more complicated. Um, nice. Okay. Uh, and are you, do you know what the final one is about? The unit? The final one's unit struct is you can have a, a, a struct that has no data at all. Um, and so this is called a unit struct. And so to do that, you just say let unit struct equals unit struct. And uh, it just exists. There, there are some reasons why this is useful uh, if you want, uh, but uh, we probably should, since we have limited time, I don't want to get super into it. But just like the point is, is that uh, you know you can have any number of things you want, including zero things. So uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll pretend I know what that one's for then. Okay. Yeah, totally. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, okay, so do you want to do struct two, or do you want to jump? Uh, to else? Let's let's briefly let's not do struct two because this is going into some other things. Let's check out struct three real fast because I want to see if right. So this is going to cover methods, which is I think going to be interesting. We can just go over it really briefly. You don't have to go into all the details, but 
the point is, like I said, we have this separation between the data and the behavior. So here we have our struct package, which has a country, it's a string, and recipient country, it's a string, and then a weight is I32. So this is just purely the data. We use the impl keyword to declare an implementation of package. So this is saying like, this is gonna be all the methods that are involved. Um, and so uh, here we have three methods, one is new, one is is international and one is get fees. You can kind of see the uh, some of the versions of the syntax here. So this is what would be called a static method in other languages. We just call it a, 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 a associated function in Rust. Details don't really matter. The point is, is that this would take three arguments, the country, the recipient country, the weight in grams, and we'll return a package. And so you would like, uh, you know, return the value by creating the struct. So um, this gets, gets declared down here, so package colon colon new is how you'd invoke it, and you'd be able to pass in those three things and you would get a package back. Um, if you wanted a method that lets you do like method syntax, like foo.bar, um, here you would take a, the first argument is this self argument. So it's very similar to self in JavaScript or Ruby or Python. Uh, we're explicit about it like Python rather than implicit about it like Ruby. So the, the first argument being self means that this would be a method. So if we had, say, a package of some kind, uh, then we could say p.is international, and that gives you that method to call syntax. And so this gives you Rust sort of like an OO kind of like feel because you have these methods, but it's a little cleaner in that your data and your behavior are cleanly separated as opposed to being declared in all of one thing. And in this example, you might say like that's not super useful because you just declare both of them anyway. That's totally true. Part of it is because sometimes you only have data and so you just have structs. And so rather than having two separate concepts, a struct and a class, you just have one, everything is a struct. Sometimes you have methods, sometimes you don't have methods and that feels a little cleaner. Um, also, it's because you can declare methods on other people's structs if you want. Um, and there's some interesting rules about those details there, but by splitting them up into two separate things, you get that control over like, sometimes you just have data, sometimes you have both, sometimes you put your own methods on someone else's data. Um, and so uh, that's kind of like how all that stuff sort of works. Um, so you kind of get this OO-ish feel without exactly being OO. Um, if that all makes it's, sense. It seems very familiar to the way that the Go works as well. With Definitely. Their Go yes, is very similar in this regard, for sure. And yeah, I, uh, traits are what we call interfaces in Go. Um, so that has a very similar syntax where you say impl trait for package instead of just impl package. And that's how you would implement an interface. Um, and it feels very similar where you would take interfaces as arguments, and you know then you can pass in any structure that implements the interface and do all that kind of thing. Nice. OK. I think we'll leave it there rather totally. than trying to rush through anything else in a, in a, in a matter of a few minutes. Um, so let's remove the screen. If anyone has any questions, feel free. We'll give you a, a minute to drop them into the chat and, and we can just quickly talk for a second. Yeah. So, you know, I think Rust should hopefully feel familiar enough to people that come from other C-based languages. You know, there are a few quirks that have to be learned, as I'm sure with all languages, for sure. Yeah. Um, and we've got an example here of Rustlings. And obviously, you've got your book, the Rust programming book. Are there any other resources you would recommend for people to check out? Definitely. So we have... Uh... There's multiple discords that you can join for getting help in a live chat environment as opposed to uh, you know posting things. There's also the user forum at users.rustlang.org where you can ask questions um, if you prefer a forum to uh, a discord. Um, and those are both really great resources for getting going. The other one I would say, and this kind of an interesting trick is, there's been a lot of people who learn Rust who try it once and get frustrated and say, this doesn't make any sense to me. And then they leave for six months and they come back and they try it again. And they're like, this makes perfect sense. Why did I get frustrated the first time? And so, uh, you know, you should give Rust a try. And if, if it's not for you, that's totally fine. Uh, maybe it never will be, but also, you know, just try giving it a while and coming back. Sometimes I haven't figured out, like, this is like really, if I could figure out what it is that happens in those months and like get people to understand it immediately, like I would do it. But sometimes you just need to like take a step away. It's kind of like that old programmer advice of like go on a walk or take a shower or do something else. And like, eventually the answer kind of comes to you. We found that that really happens with learning Rust a lot. Like people will try it be like, this is too hard. I don't understand anything. I'm going to quit. 
And then they come back and they're like, this makes sense. And sometimes it takes a couple tries. We've had people say, oh yeah, I had to give it three or four tries before it made sense, but now it makes perfect sense. Um, and so, so yeah, I don't know. But that's also the other bit of advice I would give you is take advantage of the fact that the community exists and loves answering questions. Please post questions and get help if you want. And uh, you know, if you don't like Rust, that's totally fine. Maybe someday you'll like it better. Maybe, maybe not. Like, there's lots of programming languages <laughs> when they have so much time. So uh, you know, it's it's cool. Yeah, I think that's one of my problems is that I'm too busy playing with random esoteric languages instead of actually building anything useful in one language. Like totally, I keep yeah. jumping between. There's just too many good things out there. You know, there's Rust that I want to get better at. There's Pony that I want to get better at. There's yeah. Zig that I want to get better at. And I'm just like, I want to play with all these things. Um, which it's is definitely not enough sure. time in the day. No, no, definitely not. All right, uh, so we've got a couple of things here. SD said, lovely session. Thank you very Thanks. much. Uh, Rod asked a question, which I'll rephrase slightly. Um, yeah. Is the future of Rust secure with the recently offset Mozilla? Yeah, so there is about 200 people that work on Rust in general. And at the time of the Mozilla layoffs, like before the layoffs happened, only four or five of those people were employed by Mozilla. So um, I, it's always tricky to answer this question because those are my friends and former colleagues. And so I don't want to say they don't matter because they do matter because they are wonderful people and did a lot of work in Rust. But at the same time, they're a small number of a large group of people. And so the overall movement of Rust is not really affected by the Mozilla layoffs. Um, additionally, uh, you will have seen and you will see in the future more and more companies um, picking up getting into Rust development. So the big announcement in the last week is uh, Amazon is like explicitly hiring a bunch of people to work on Rust itself. And so we're seeing other companies pick up where Mozilla left off, even though like, as I said before, most of the Rust development was volunteer in the first place. So um, it, it affects us in the sense that, uh, you know, some people have had to shift around and some people still work on Rust, but only in a spare time capacity instead of a full-time one like they used to. Um, and some people have just found jobs other places working on Rust. And so, uh, you know, but definitely like the future is bright and the situation with Mozilla is pretty independent from the situation of Rust these days. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't add any more flavor to that other than what you've said, but I, I can say from the cloud native perspective, which is where my, you know, it's the community I'm most involved in, is that all these companies are now adopting Rust for all sorts of crazy technology. And yeah. I think there's definitely enough enough people contributing in that space that Rust would definitely have a future regardless of what happens in the yeah. And I also, also read that the foundation right. is maybe what you're about to say is the other part I didn't say is we're working <laughs> on starting a Rust foundation. And so you'll hear some news about that in the coming months. Uh, and so that's also kind of, uh, you know, a part of that future too. Yeah, all sorts of things going on there. And there was news last week about several being handed over to the Linux Foundation, which mm -hmm. I'm sure are, are probably a key component of the Rust Foundation work too, hopefully. So we'll see. Um, I wouldn't be worried. Uh, so Rod said, thank you. Uh, and finally, I'll finish with SD saying, hey, Steve, you need to come back so we can do intermediate rest. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, sounds good. I wouldn't make him commit on here. Don't, it's all right. Uh, but we'll speak afterwards. We'll, regardless of Steve's availability, I do plan on doing more Rust content, and hopefully Steve can be a part of that too. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. That was that was awesome. I think you know we managed, hopefully covered enough of the basics that people can get started. If you've tried it before, definitely give it another try. As was said, you know sometimes you just have to try it twice, like all of totally. <laughs> uh, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you again for joining me, and I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye.